Good afternoon and welcome to the Internet of Things. We're so glad that you could be with us today. For those of you who are out there at home or at our locations in um, Manchester at GNAT or Orca TV in Montpelier, we're so glad you could join us. And Steve Shepard is here um, to talk to us about the future, which is something that he does with great humor and um, intelligence, and we're so glad. I'm Lauren Glenn Davidian, and I um, am a member of the staff here at Common Good Vermont and the executive director of CCTV Center for Media and Democracy. And we have Morgan um, Webster with us, who's the coordinator of Common Good Vermont. She's there in the back. And we have Barry Silver, who's our marketing queen, who's in the control room with Kevin Harms, our director. And of course, we have Kim Vilmer behind the camera. So thanks, everyone, for helping make this happen, and thank you all for coming. Steve Shepard has um, been a friend to us here at CCTV and Common Good Vermont for many, many years. We turn to him when we want to know what's happening. He's our crystal ball man, and um, he's able to translate complex trends into um, really ideas that we can understand and apply, and a lot of the work and advances that we've done, even lately this streaming um, of this program itself has come from his work to help us expand our reach and impact, and I hope that Steve's presentation today on the Internet of Things will give you some great ideas to think about and some actionable um, concepts. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Lauren Gunn. I appreciate that. Hi, everyone. Oh, you're I'm mic'd. I am good? mic'd. Okay. I'm, I am high tech, or at least medium tech. Um, good to have you here with us. Uh, I'm not sure I can bring intelligence, but I'll try to bring humor at least to, uh, to the, this little august organization. We're going to talk about the Internet of Things today, but but I'm really going to talk about more than that because to talk about the Internet of Things is really to limit the conversation uh, unnecessarily. So I'm going to broaden that just a little bit. Uh, and at the end of this thing, what you'll really get a sense of is what is the Internet of Things? Why does it matter? But what, what does it really do in terms of interworking with a few other really cool technologies? So I'm going to try to give you a, a broader sense of that and then I'm happy to answer any questions either now or along the way as we go in. I was in an airport recently, and uh, this was a rather propitious moment because I had just received my invitation to buy, this is the part I love, your invitation to purchase a set of Google Glass. You see, you, you don't just buy one. You have, to, you have to win the lottery. And then if you win the lottery, then you are lucky enough to be able to send Google a check for some $1,500, and they will send you your Google Glass. Um, I wasn't convinced I needed a pair of $1,500 Google Glasses, so. I was kind of hoping I might meet somebody that had one, and I did. I was in an airport, sitting, waiting for a flight, and uh, somebody walked by me. I was reading a magazine. A fellow walked by me, and as he walked by, he kind of blocked the sunlight, and I looked up, and this was the most immense human being I think I've ever seen. He looked like a professional football player. He blocked the sun. Okay, He was a huge guy, and he was wearing Google Glass. And this is the first human being I've seen in public wearing Google Glass. Okay, so I, at last, I'm going to get a chance to talk to somebody that's actually got some. But then I decided I wasn't going to talk to him. Because it was pretty clear to me that this guy had some bizarre neurological disorder that would make it difficult to talk to him. Because he sat down about four chairs, you know those rows of connected chairs in airports? He sat down about four chairs down from me. And he was sitting, he looked like he had St. Vitus's dance. He was he, 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 making all these strange noise. And I thought, eh, okay, never mind. The whole row of seats is shaking, okay? And I'm sitting there trying to read my magazine as I'm shaking all over the place. And all of a sudden, the guy stopped shaking. And he reached up and he jerked off the glasses. And he said something I won't repeat. But he jerked off the glasses. And the shaking miraculously stopped. And I looked over at him, and he must have perceived that I was looking because he looked over at me with this kind of embarrassed look on his face, and he said, were you watching me? And I went, uh-huh. <laughs> and he said, oh, I'm sorry that I was playing tennis. <laughs> he was serving the ball back and forth to himself on his Google glasses. So this little, what well, you can't see, this little thing here is the screen, and it projects onto your eye. And he, I said, you know, you might want to play something a little bit less kinetic when you're out in public because it's, it's you know, anyway. That's a, that's a kind of an interesting example of Internet of Things. That's a thing. And that thing talks to other things autonomously without human intervention. And that's really cool. Sort of. Sort of. I mean, there's a little bit of a so what behind that as well. 
Well, let me, let me take you a little deeper into the so what part of it. About, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago or so, I was, uh, I was doing some work. I do a lot of work in Africa, and I was in Africa doing some work and, and um, working on a, actually a cheetah rehabilitation project that I'm involved in. And so we now fast forward a little bit, and I was doing another project. I was in Tokyo, and I was walking around in Tokyo, and there's a, there's a part of the city of Tokyo where all the consumer electronics stores are. And this is a public service announcement. You don't ever want to go to this part of Tokyo. And, and let me explain to you why. This is a place where you walk into a store and you pick something up that you've never seen before. And you look at it and 100% of the time your reaction is, <laughs> I don't even know what this does, but I need it. Okay, it's one of those kind of places, all right? So stay away, okay? Well, I'm walking down the sidewalk desperately trying not to look in the store windows. And because of the nature of this part of Tokyo, there's lots of electronic signage, digital signage, big electronic billboards, and, and they're big. I mean, these things are six to eight feet wide and four or five feet tall, and they, they're sort of on poles like, over the sidewalk, so you actually walk under them as you're walking along. Well, I'm walking along, and I happen to look up, and this is what I see. This image that you see on the screen was what was on the, the billboard in Tokyo. Yeah, so what they're seeing, what they're seeing is a photograph of me behind a very large 500 millimeter lens, which I do not carry around in public and certainly not on the streets of Tokyo, and a photograph of me with a cheetah in Africa and a Nikon camera logo and a bunch of words that say, hey Steve, welcome to Tokyo, we're really glad you're here. Listen, if you go two blocks that way and three blocks that way, you'll come to Shibuya Camera where we serve, or serve, where we sell exclusively Nikon equipment. And if you bring your passport, we'll give you a 30% discount. Guess what? Oh, I had to buy a second camera bag to get everything home. Now here's my question. How'd they do that? How'd they do that? Well, here's my answer to you. Well, facial recognition maybe. It's certainly a possibility. But I'm going to go to one something a little simpler than that, I think, because I really don't know the answer. Here's what I think happened. I think that I walked through a deliberately open hotspot. All mobile phones pretty much have Wi-Fi and mine certainly does, and I think I may have just walked through a hotspot and it picked up my phone. It, they, the people in the black helicopters, whatever. Somebody picked up my phone. And it, they, the system Googled my mobile phone number. Now when you Google my mobile phone number, various things come up, but one of the things that comes up is Shepard Images, which is my photography site. And if you go to Shepard Images, there's a page there, among other things, devoted to gear, because for some stupid reason, people care what kind of camera you use. I, I, I've never understood that. You, know, you go to somebody's house for dinner, and it's, oh, this is delicious. What kind of a stove do you have? I mean, it's stupid, okay? Anyway, so I've got a page devoted to the gear that I use, because people care. And I think they got there, and they said, okay, well, this is a Nikon person, so we're going to grab a Nikon logo. And then these photographs were on the site, taken at various times. And they put these things together and said, let's give it a shot. And they put it up. You notice that there was no human involved in this process. It was my phone talking to a system which queried a database, which went to the web, which ultimately came back and said, put this up on this billboard like that. Now, did it work? Clearly it worked. This is the kind of stuff we're talking about. Autonomous interaction among multiple systems. Now, some could argue that that's creepy. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But I submit to you that this is sort of an example of where we're going. This is an example of the kind of capabilities we have in terms of information gathering, analysis, and decision making that can in fact lead to some really intriguing things that I'm going to show you in just a few minutes in terms of healthcare and education and government and some other pretty interesting areas. Okay? So here's the admonition I want to start you off with. Most of you have probably at one time or another seen five-year-olds playing soccer, right? Here's the problem. Actually, it's the best soccer to watch in the same sense that t-ball is the baseball game that should be broadcast on national television, but that's just my opinion. Here's, here's the deal with five-year-olds playing soccer. Everybody chases the ball. There's no strategy. 
Everybody sees the ball, including the goalie, and they all chase the ball. All right? That phenomenon is often referred to in the business world as the bright, shiny object problem. Everybody chases the bright, shiny object. Here's my admonition to you, my warning, my caveat, my concern. Internet of Things is the bright, shiny object today. Okay? It's important, don't get me wrong, but it's the thing everybody's chasing because it's just so cool. The problem is that if you, if you focus on the bright, shiny object, you miss everything that surrounds it. And the real opportunities, the real sort of force behind the move to the future here is not so much Internet of Things, it's the ecosystem within which Internet of Things operates. So I tell people all the time that it's not about it's not about one thing. Don't focus on the bright, shiny object. Focus on the bright, shiny ecosystem. And I'm going to show you that ecosystem because it's really, really important that you get the broader view of what's really going on here. Okay? So here it is. This is what it looks like. It's a bunch of interconnected technologies that include the Internet of Things and this weird phenomenon that we're going to talk about called Big Data and something called Analytics which comes out of the Big Data and broadband connectivity, sometimes mobile, that allows us to hook everything together and applications that do interesting things with the data and of course this whole issue of the IP network. All these pieces together are the bright shiny ecosystem that I want you thinking about as we go forward and start to think about opportunities and places where this technology could actually find a home and make a difference for people. And trust me, it is making a difference already. So let me start with just a quick overview of a couple of fundamental technologies that are a big piece of this. Most of you have a phone that's somewhere up in the corner of the screen when you turn it on displays this little word that says LTE, right? That's your, your data speed, right? Long-term evolution is what that stands for. It's the current fastest version of mobile data that we have available. Okay? It's fourth generation wireless for those of you that are tracking the generations. And it's fast. It basically gives you the equivalent of, um, of Wi-Fi speed on your mobile phone. That's pretty good. That's 50 megabits or so per second. That's a lot of bandwidth. Okay? Recently I was at Bell Laboratories. I do a lot of work with Bell Labs. And I got a chance to play with some 5G and 6G phones. Those are the next two iterations of this technology. 5G is basically the same as, uh, as 4G, except that, except that instead of giving you 50 megabits a second or so, it's going to give you 10 gigabits per second to your mobile phone. What are you going to do with 10 gigabits to your mobile? You're going to teleport yourself? What is this for? Okay. And 6G. 6G is coming along now, and depending on which paper you read, they're talking about 100 to 200 gigabits per second of bandwidth available to your mobile phone. You're going to have to drag a little red wagon behind you to hold the batteries that are going to be required to run this thing. Okay? It's astonishing how much bandwidth we have. Why? A, because we can, but B, because the applications are evolving to the point that we're going to need a lot more bandwidth as time goes on. And we'll talk a little more about that as we go along. So the network that connects everything together is crucial. Here's another thing. I have this personal belief that the web is dead. Let me say that a different way. The website is dead. I should probably explain that. What would you rather have? A website online that people have to go find a connection for and type in your web address and go to your website, or a presence online that causes your customer's pocket to vibrate, and when they pull out their phone, there's a message there from you. Clearly, the second is the better choice, especially if you're trying to market or sell or maintain a presence with your customers. For the first time in history, the number of people accessing, customer, accessing information online via mobile devices exceeded the number of people accessing information on fixed devices just in the last year or so. And what's starting to happen is we're now starting to see the plateauing of websites and the extraordinary growth of apps as a replacement for having a presence via, via a website. This is the reach out and touch someone phenomenon again, okay? This is the idea that I can now have something in somebody's pocket, A, because they want to have it, and B, because I can provide value instantaneously at any point no matter where they are. So we're starting to see this interesting move toward the mobile device. And mobile is going to be the phenomenon that keeps coming out of this, folks. So just keep that in mind. 
Here's another thing. This concept of virtualization. All right, I'm not going to get technical on you here, but this is a big deal. Everybody hears about the cloud. You've all heard about the cloud, the cloud. Everybody's going to have cloud. You've got to have cloud. Who are you if you don't have cloud? Cloud is important, and basically what it means is that we're going to share infrastructure. Virtualization literally means it's a lie. Okay? If somebody's going to sell you a virtual network, what they're telling you is they're lying to you. They're not going to sell you a network. It's virtual. It's not real. It's shared among a bunch of people. The economics are really great for this. We can share computer resources, storage resources, applications, development platforms, all kinds of cool things, all of which play into this ecosystem that's part of the whole Internet of Things phenomenon. Okay? So virtualization, you'll hear that word a lot, is real. We're now in the point where we are virtualizing the telephone network. Those great big central offices that everybody has seen where all the switches and stuff are, that stuff's going away. It's going into the cloud. It's becoming part of a big data center somewhere. The customer doesn't see a whole lot of difference, but the folks providing the service do. A lot of opportunity, a lot of interesting changes coming. Here's another thing. The Internet Protocol, IP, which is the protocol upon which essentially everything works, is an embedded, inextricable, important part of everybody's life. Okay? And it's become the network. Okay? The telephone companies have all announced that by the end of 2018, they will no longer support the technologies that they have used since the late 1800s. They're going away. They're gone. The manufacturers of that equipment have sunned down the technology. It's gone. After 2018, they won't support it anymore. So everything is going to go IP, which means everything is going to be on the same sort of type of network, which is going to make it a lot easier for people. It's kind of interesting. That that is a standard gauge railroad there, which means that it's exactly four feet, 11 and a half inches from rail to rail. Center of this rail to the center of this rail, four feet, 11 and a half inches. Do you know why? This is a great story. You'll appreciate this. Well, here in North America, the railroads were built by folks who came over from England in the 19th century to build the railroads. They'd already built the railroads in, in the UK, so they came over to build them here. They brought all their tools with them. Well, it turns out that the railroads in the UK had rails that were four feet, 11 and a half inches apart. So they naturally built the same gauge when they came here. So do you know why they're four feet, 11 and a half inches apart in England? No? It's kind of interesting. It's because what predated the railroads were, in fact, uh, these trolley systems in the big cities. So in Manchester and London and so on, Brighton, they had these, they had these, these trolley systems, and the, the, the wheels on those trolleys were four feet 11 and a half inches apart. So, so that's how they built their rails. Do you, know, do you know why those wheels were four feet 11 and a half inches? It's really interesting. It's because what predated those, tr those trolleys were horse-drawn carriages, these beautiful sort of graceful things pulled by a couple of horses and they had these great big wooden wheels. And it's really kind of funny, those, those wheels were four feet 11 and a half inches apart from, from rim to rim. Really interesting. Do you know why? No? Well, because if you go to the major cities, you'll find that a lot of the major cities have roads that were originally built by the Romans. And they were built with these sandstone paving blocks, soft sandstone. And those paving blocks, for some strange reason, have these ruts ground into them. And those ruts are precisely four feet, 11 and a half inches apart, which is just astonishing. And what they learned was that discretion is the better part of valor. If you're in one of those those graceful little delicate carriages and your wheels get into that rut, you better just stay there because you're liable to break an axle if you try to get out. So they just stuck with that standard, okay? Do you know why those ruts were four feet, 11 and a half inches apart? Well, it's because the Romans had these horse-drawn uh, um, chariots that had iron-covered wheels. They were wooden wheels that were covered with iron. And as they ground their way down the roads, they made these trenches, which is why they were four feet, 11 and a half inches apart. Because you see that the wheels on those on those, those chariots were four feet 11 and a half inches apart. And the reason for that is, that is that that was the appropriate distance required for design to ensure that the two horses pulling this thing under gallop would not kick each other as they ran. Okay? Now why is that so important? Well, it's important because if you think about the space shuttle, you probably wonder where I'm going, don't, don't you? Okay. If you think about the space shuttle, um, you remember those two big solid fuel boosters that were on either side of the big tank? Those things are built by a company in Utah called Morton Thiokol. And when they originally built them, they were much longer and much fatter than the ones you see today or saw before they you know, put, shut the system down. 
they wouldn't fit on a standard rail car. They were too big. But because the standard for rail transport was what it was, the payload had to change. They weren't going to redesign the railroad system because that's the only way to get the things to Houston or to, to Florida to, for launch. So the designers of the engines were forced to redesign the engines, which they did. They made them narrower and they made them shorter so they'd fit on a standard gauge rail. Okay? It's a standard. Standards dictate all. Okay? So just to kind of make sure that you remember this, I want you to think about the fact that the next time you see that incredible photograph of the shuttle, t you know, flying with those huge plumes of flame coming down, you know, rocketing off into the heavens, I want you to consider the fact that that extraordinary, unbelievably well-designed, super over-engineered device is based on the width of a horse's ass. Okay, so <laughs> you'll never forget IP now, will you? Okay. This this is fundamental to everything. Fourth generation mobile systems and beyond all presume that the underlying network is based on IP. IP is what runs the internet. The point here is, folks, that we've got one network. It's the one ring that binds them all. That technology is fundamentally important to everything, okay? And it's part of this ecosystem. All right. So now let's look at the fun stuff. Now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the technologies that are, in fact, part of this whole sort of Internet of Things phenomenon. Here's what happens. People do stuff. They move around, they drive, they buy things, they shop, they browse, you know, they, they, they engage in various activities. And those activities cause these things, which are in effect a variety of sensors, of many, many flavors, and I'll explain them in a minute, to spew out a little bit of data indicating or or sort of giving an insight into what that person is doing, okay? That data gets collected in a big database somewhere, usually resident in a cloud over a broadband network, and then some kind of analysis is done on it that says, hey, we just got some insight. You know what we need to do? We need to do something to change the nature of that human activity, okay? So it's a cycle. Now, what are these things? Well, they're, um, there's something as simple as those little RFID tags that all of you have had a personal relationship with when you walk out of Barnes and Noble and accidentally set off the alarm system, right? Have you ever seen when you buy a book, especially if it's a larger book or a more expensive book, the first thing they do is they take the book and they rub it on the counter? You've seen them do that? You don't have to rub it on the counter, okay? That just gets the book excited, all right? That what you do is you just hold it next to the counter and a reader underneath it activates that little copper coil that you sometimes find stuck inside the book. And what that coil is is nothing more than an antenna. And the energy from the radio in the reader activates a little radio chip in that, in that, that tag that identifies uniquely that particular book attached to that particular tag. And when you pay for it, it sends a little piece of message into that tag that says, paid for. So when you walk out between those two stanchions on either side of the door, it does an alarm, okay? So if it ever does alarm, it's because they either didn't get it close enough or forgot to disarm it or you stole the book, one of the two, okay? So the point is that's a sensor, all right? There are lots of different kinds of these things. I mean, for example, you might have a sensor that is built into a watch, right? If you have an Apple Watch, the Apple Watch is cool because not only does it have little sensors underneath the bottom of the watch that measure biological information, blood pressure, oxygenation, pulse, respiration rate, and so on, it also has the ability to now talk to your phone. Notice that's device-to-device -device communications and you have no control over it. That's really cool because then you can get all that information on your phone and you can read the app and how many steps did I take today, et cetera. But you know what's really cool? What's really cool is when your phone autonomously talks to the database of other phones so you can compare your results to your friends, which creates that little competitive thing that says, I should be walking more. Okay? That's an internet of things. It's a connection of things talking to each other, causing some kind of a reaction. Okay? Here's some other examples. Smart meters. Your car, if you've ever bought a car that was built from January 2014 onward anywhere in North America, the car has a phone in it, a smartphone. It's not for you. It's for the car. So as you're driving down the road 
and the analytics in the car detect, for example, that the fuel pump is getting a little bit wonky, the car calls the dealer and spews diagnostic information into the dealer's system. And the next thing you know, you get a phone call from your dealer saying, hey, Steve, your car called, huh? Okay. You need to come in because your fuel pump's getting a little funny. We need to check it. That's machine to machine communications, no human involvement at all. Okay? I have a friend who lives in Dallas. He's a former consultant with one of the big, uh, big accounting firms, and he created this really cool application. So I want you to think of the following scenario. You're going home late at night. Okay? It's like 10.30 at night. You know, it's one of those nights, you'd, stuff was going on at work and it, you just had to stay really late. Now you're going home. All you want to do is get home and relax and just do nothing. And you come to that light. You know the one. The one that doesn't have the sensor in the pavement, right? And you're sitting there, and you're sitting there, and you've already backed up and gone forward three times hoping you'll trip the imaginary sensor in the pavement. Nothing's happened. Here's the other thing. You can see to the horizon in all four. There isn't a car anywhere. You blow the light. And two days later, you get your ticket in the mail. How'd they do that? Well, there wasn't a cop behind a billboard. There wasn't a camera. Here's what happened. Your phone and presumably your new car have a phone in them. That phone's a sensor. It's a thing. All right? You went underneath that light at the appropriate speed. You weren't speeding, but you were moving. But the light was red. And the light has a sensor in it. And the sensor knows the light was red. And the sensor knows that at the precise moment that that light was red, you were moving under that light at 30 miles an hour. Here's your ticket. Machine to machine. They're going to get you no matter what, okay? This is what I'm talking about, is this kind of interesting insight that we can gain from having these things talk to each other, okay? What we end up with is this system where you got things capturing data, some way to compute the data to figure out what it means, some way to analyze it to understand the implications of it, and then a way of collaborating, a network that connects it all together so that we can create this ecosystem that says, here's a way to gain human insight. Now, some of it is stuff that we're not particularly happy about, like, I don't want you sending me a ticket. But as you're going to see in a few minutes, some of it is related to things like healthcare and public safety and so on, and it's extraordinarily important, and it's stuff that we definitely do want. Okay? How many of you have a smartphone? Just about everybody? Let me show you what's in that smartphone. Let me just show you. Okay? There's a thing in there called an accelerometer. It's the thing that makes the screen rotate when you turn the phone. I mean, that's just really cool. Okay? There's a thing in there called the 4G radio. It's the radio that allows you to talk to the high-speed networks that are out there. Because we still have a, some low-end wireless stuff, there's a second-generation radio in there. There's a gyroscope. That's why the compass in your phone works. There's a Wi-Fi radio, of course. There's a GPS chip in there so that you can activate that and we can find it. There's a Bluetooth radio in there. There's a third generation wireless radio in there. And of course, there's this little thing, if you happen to be on the Apple platform, called an iBeacon. Every single one of these devices routinely spews information into the network autonomously. Okay? Now, I'm not trying to build conspiracy theory here. Just be aware that this is how these things work. All right? They're all used to your benefit. They're all used to allow you to talk, to access the web, to get GPS information, etc. One of them is kind of intriguing. If you're on the Apple platform, you have this thing called an iBeacon. This is why we have the ability on the Apple platform to offer this little application called Find My iPhone or Find My iPad. When you're wandering around talking and so on, this little chip is constantly saying, I'm here. Here I am. I'm right here. Here I am. It's constantly chirping out information that identifies it and identifies its physical location through GPS. Okay? Now here's the funny thing about iBeacon that you may not know. You go to bed at night, turn off your phone. While you're lying there trying to get to sleep, it's not going to disturb you, but the whole time it's going, I'm here. I'm right here. I'm not moving. I'm here. 
Okay, here's my point. You can't turn it off. You can pry open the phone. You can go in there, take out the battery. It's going to keep on chirping because it has its own battery. Because otherwise, what's the point of having to find my iPhone? If you can pull out the battery, it's not going to work anymore, right? So it's got its own. So you see, this stuff is happening all the time around us. We're just awash in these kinds of applications. All right? Now we'll, we'll decide good, bad, indifferent here in just a minute. Here's what we do know. This is a technology family that's going to generate about $7 trillion in market value over the next few years. Good, bad, right, wrong, it's a big business and it's going to create a lot of jobs. So this new technology stuff is really starting to happen and you're seeing it in the most unlikely places. One of the things that's created the advantage of to it is that the, um, the price of the little things has really dropped. Like those iBeacons I just talked about, you can buy them. They cost $4. And it looks like a little, you know those things you can buy to make your own climbing wall, those weird form little plastic things that you can mount on a board or on a wall? Well, they look kind of like that. They're about this big around. They look like a little hockey puck for four bucks. Let's assume you have a big retail space and you're fighting against the online world like all retail spaces. So you allocate a little money. You allocate $400. You go out and buy 100 of these things. They're really great. You open it, take it out of the package. It has a peel-off strip. When you peel off the strip, it activates the radio. That radio will operate for about eight years. Okay? And at the same time, it exposes a sticky surface. So you just take this thing and attach it to the ceiling. And you create a grid of these things on the ceiling of your store. Okay? And here's what happens. Steve walks into the store with his iPhone. The first one of these things I encounter on the ceiling, it registers me. It basically says, I got one. And then as I move around the store, these iBeacons hand me off from iBeacon to iBeacon. It tracks me as I move through the store. So I'm in the store to buy socks, okay? So I walk in, I'm going to be good, I'm going to go straight to the socks, and I'm heading to the socks, and oh look, DVDs. Let's look at the DVDs here. So I stop for a few minutes, and I'm going through the DVDs and looking because there's something I might want, and nope, that's not why I came here, and I head for the socks. Oh look, fishing equipment. Let's look at the gear. Play with the fishing equipment for a while, but the DVDs are calling to me. So I go back over here and play with the DVDs. And no, I'm, I'm going to get my socks. And I head straight to the socks, and I grab my socks, and I turn around, and I head back to the store, and I get about 50 feet from the checkout line, and my phone buzzes. I pull it out and look at it, and guess what it says? Hey, next three minutes only, all DVDs, 50% off. Good? It's the ultimate impulse buy thing. Instead of having to go up to the front to get the impulse purchase, no, it follows you everywhere you go. This is important for the retail world. Whether we like it as consumers or not has very little bearing because the retailers are going to fight for their lives against things like Amazon. This is their opportunity to create a much more intimate experience for their customers and a better relationship. Okay. So this is really intriguing stuff and it's happening and it's happening really big time right now. Now what about the applications? Well there's a bunch of them. This is a little box. It's about the size of a little matchbook. It's about that big. You take this thing it, and you get a free app with it. You toss it in your luggage. And for somebody like me who lives on airplanes, this thing allows me to track the location of my suitcase at any point in time with my mobile phone. So on those multiple occasions every month when my bag takes a different trip than I do, I can at least figure out where it is. Yeah, this is pretty cool. It's four bucks. Okay. Here's another one. Any tennis players in here? Or golfers? So this is a little company that makes this device, this particular device, you attach to the handle of your tennis racket. It doesn't weigh anything. And there's a similar one that goes on your golf club. And what it does is it talks to an app that you download from the web free of charge on your phone. And what it does is it measures the speed, acceleration, angle, did you open the face of the racket, et cetera, every time you swing. And it builds a database so that you can train yourself to do things differently. You get real-time feedback as you play. It's kind of cool. Ah, uh, got it. Yes, yes, yes. Right, so the ITF is the, is the, the uh, sports organization that sanctions this kind of stuff. They kind of bury each other, Lauren Glenn, so I'll, I'll go through them quickly and then, we'll, then we can talk about them. 
This, these that you see here, these little, this water glass with these two little tablets next to it, are in fact tablets. You swallow these things, okay? And the, the sort of spongy, rubbery stuff around it is made out of a form of gelatin. And it's got chemicals in it, electrolytes in it, that when hit by stomach acid, it turns on a little battery on these things. And these little things are cameras. And they go through your system and they take a photograph about every three seconds as they make their way through your system. And the photographs go, thankfully, to your doctor's phone, not yours. And um, they, you can get complete gastrointestinal health information from these things, okay? With no invasive procedures required, all right? And no, you don't collect them afterwards, they just... But isn't that interesting? I mean, that's an intriguing little change. Here's another one for you. As the, as the, the, the proud owner of a, of a brand new two-month-old grandchild, this diaper has a sensor in it. Okay? And by the way, it increases, it increases the cost of the diaper by six cents. It's nothing. Okay? But it sends a message, I can't even say it with a straight face, but it sends a message to your phone when the diaper is wet or otherwise. Okay? Here, Mom. Okay. I find this one really intriguing. This is a set of earphones that Microsoft sells. You put the earbuds into your ears. The earbuds have sensors in them that measure your biological state. And then it selects the music for you based on are you stressed, are you calm, are you falling asleep, etc. Somebody's getting paid to think these things up. I mean, this is kind of an interesting idea. In a similar mode, these light bulbs talk to an app on your phone. Okay, and these light bulbs cost $4 a piece, so they're not cheap, but they're not ridiculous either. And you can adjust the color of the light bulb, or you can have it do it for you automatically based on mood, time of day, et cetera. So you can go from like sunlight to that nice warm glow that you like all the way down into the primary colors. It's ridiculous. Okay? All right. So let me shift gears for a moment now and talk a little bit about this phenomenon called big data. So here is, to my knowledge, the first example of big data. This photograph is the photograph of J. Edgar Hoover's I Know Everything There Is to Know About You room at the FBI in the 1940s. It's a card catalog with everybody in it. Okay? Well, we've gone a little bit beyond that now. Right? So let's talk about what big data is. You'll hear this term a lot. Okay? So let me just explain what big data is. Big data is not just a big database. It's something much more sophisticated than that, and it comes in two flavors, okay? There is something called structured big data, and there is something called unstructured big data, and they're both important. Structured big data is any data that you can put into a spreadsheet or a database, a SQL database, which means it's probably numbers, all right? So sales figures, population changes, all that kind of stuff, that's structured big data. And here's the key characteristic of structured big data. I know what it's going to tell me. When I run the analysis on it, I know, I may not know the number, but I know what it's going to indicate to me. Are sales up or down? Is the population growing or shrinking or flat? I know that kind of stuff, okay? That's important. But let's look at unstructured big data for a moment. Unstructured big data is data that cannot, in fact, be put into a spreadsheet. It cannot be analyzed in a traditional linear manner. Here's why. Because the kind of information that we see in a big data database would be a combination of this. Your purchases, your likes on Facebook. What photographs have you uploaded lately to your Instagram account? What was your GPA in high school? How healthy are you? Who are your friends? What kind of pet food do you buy? Right? Have you purchased any books lately, and if so, what were they? What has the weather been where you live, and what magazines do you subscribe to? From all of that information, I can learn some really, really interesting things. But because it's unstructured, here's the really fun part. I don't know what it's going to tell me at the end of the day. I don't know. Let me show you how. 
1986, 6% 6 of all the global data we had was digitized. Today, that number is well over 99%. Now, what's the so what? The so what is I can now take that data and manipulate it. It's not just on paper sitting in a library somewhere. I can get to it, which means I can include it in an, anal in an analytics engine and I can get information from fine data that might be valuable to me. Here's another one. Between the beginning of human history in 2003, as a civilization, we created five exabytes of data. That's five with 18 zeros. That's five billion gigabytes of data, okay? From the beginning of time to 2003. Today, we generate five exabytes of data every six minutes. That's a lot of data, right? How do you analyze it? How do you understand it? How do you gain insight from it? Where do you put it? Who does the analysis? And what will it yield? Every 15 minutes, we add three times the holdings of the Library of Congress in terms of data just in this country. 35% of all photographs taken in the world end up on Facebook. Now, why is that important? Beyond all the funny, snarky comments we can make, having seen a lot of those photographs? Well, if you discount all the cats, no. If you, if you go and look at them, what do they tell you? You got it. Relationships between people, relationships between people and products, people and places, and so on. There's a, there's a reason that Microsoft and Google pay Facebook almost a half a billion dollars a year each just to have access to the analytics that come out of those photographs and out of keywords and so on, okay? Because it, it yields some really interesting information, all right? 60 hours of video get uploaded to YouTube every single minute. If you're going to see it, you better start now, all right? That's eight years of content uploaded every single day. Much of which you don't care about for obvious reasons, but if you think about a mechanical system that would have the ability, say mechanical, non-human, that would have the ability to go in and look at that data and discern from that data interesting little insights and relationships, could that not in fact yield some really interesting things in terms of marketing ability, sales ability, influence, and so on? Yeah, of course it could. Right? According to Gartner, big data, just big data, is going to drive $230 billion in spending through the end of this year. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money and potentially a lot of jobs. Okay? So let's talk about the power of analytics then for just a second. Because you see, we've got the Internet of Things. The things are constantly spewing data. The data gets transported over a network. It gets stuck into a data center somewhere where it becomes big data. And then we unleash analysis engines on it, very special analysis engines on it that try to make up sort of information from it that we can actually use. Now, a couple of quick observations for you about analytics. This science is so new, this big data analytics thing is so new that there are very few companies out there that are actually doing it commercially. They tend to be very niche oriented. Like I, I have a friend who, who has a company down in the Boston area. Their sole reason for existing is to identify and track product placements in movies. So if Coca-Cola paid for 21 product appearances in that movie, this, this system has the ability to automatically identify Coca-Cola placements and then report on whether it happened or not. You know, including things like yeah, it was there. The can was there, but you couldn't see the logo because it was turned a little bit too much. Well, we're not paying for that one. Okay? Here's some interesting things about it. Anyone in the market for a used car? Anybody thinking about, like, over the next couple of years, thinking about buying a used car? Well, if you do, buy an orange one. Any questions? I go on. Why? That's a great question. <laughs> Here's why. This might surprise you, so don't be shocked, but people that buy orange cars tend to be kind of quirky. <laughs> That's assuming they don't work for a taxi cab company, okay? One of their quirks is that they take really good care of their possessions. They take, like, over-the-top good care of their possessions. 
So if you're going to buy a used car, buy an orange one. You can always paint it later. How do we know that? Because the dealer associations got together and looked at all kinds of trend-related information using a big data algorithm, and this was one of the unexpected things they learned. They did not go in and say, tell us what color is best for used cars. No. They said, here's all the data we have. Hit us with it. Right? Now that's kind of interesting. That's kind of interesting. Here's one for you. UPS Corporation. You know? As you can imagine, they've got a big carbon footprint. All right? I mean, of course they do. I mean, they've got this huge fleet of vehicles and airplanes and everything else. They have to. It's what they do. And yet, in spite of their corporate colors, they're one of the greenest companies I'm aware of. They are committed to the environment in ways way beyond anything we've, we've seen in most companies. And they're doing everything they can to reduce that carbon footprint. So one of the things they did about 10 years ago was they said, how can we, in fact, reduce our carbon imprint on the planet? And what do we have to do to find out the answer to that question? And, they, and the response that came back was, well, first of all, we need to collect data about what you do. Okay? So for example, let's figure out what a typical day in the life of a, of a driver is like. What happens in the warehouse? What happens in logistics? What happens at their hub in Louisville? And so on. And the way they did this was they put sensors everywhere. There are sensors in their driver's shoes. There are sensors in the tires on the trucks. There are sensors on the roof of the vehicles that measure the heat of the top of the vehicle because it affects how well the car performs. There are sensors all over the engine. There are sensors all over the vehicle. There are sensors on every single package in the vehicle. Watch a UPS driver when they pull up at your house or your business. The first thing they do when they shut the engine off, and they always shut the engine off, is they step out, and they walk around to the side of the car, and they put their wrist up against the side of the car. FedEx does the same thing. They wear a bracelet that has a sensor in it. That sensor talks to a reader in the truck that says, I'm leaving, this, I'm leaving the truck. And what the sensor does is two things, or the reader does is two things. It locks the vehicle down, locks the engine, locks the compartment so nobody can get in and they can't be steal it, and it makes a precise note of what time the driver left the truck. When they come back, they do it again. It unlocks the truck and says, I know how long you were gone. Now I know how long it took to deliver that package. So I can now analyze this data on a driver by driver, route by route, state by state, city by city basis. I can even analyze based on what was in the package, or who it came from, because I have the sensor information from the package. You see what's going on here? Okay. They took all this stuff and they began to analyze it. And at the end of the analysis, they came back and they said, they said, okay, here's what we've learned from putting all this data into a big data engine. We have come up with a, a, a measure that indicates that with a couple of minor changes, we can in fact reduce the number of route miles that we drive every year by about 12 million, and we can save about 40 million gallons of diesel fuel a year. All we have to do is eliminate all left-hand turns. You will rarely ever see a UPS driver turn left. They will turn left if that's the only way to get to that business over there. Now, why? You think that's what they were expecting? Of course not. But this is what came out of the analysis. And the result of it was that, in fact, they achieved those numbers, and they have achieved them every year since by using big data analytics to identify that kind of information. Okay? Here's another one. This is one of my favorites, Walmart Corporation, big data company. This company generates 6 million transactions a second worldwide. They've got a lot of data. And they do a good job of analyzing it, OK? Well, retailers, and Walmart is particularly good at this, have what they call indicator products, or canary in the coal mine products. It's where these products, for reasons no one really understands too well, if the sale of that product should spike or dramatically reduce, it typically leads to something unrelated. And they don't exactly know why. Well, Walmart has one indicator product in particular that has the following sort of characteristic scenario associated with it, and they, and they know this, they've seen it happen many, many times. If the sale of this particular product spikes to 30% or higher above the normal sales level floor, 
and is sustained for four hours or longer, they know with 100% certainty that with 12 hours after that spike occurs, there's going to be a major bump in the sale of D-cell batteries. So they actually bring in more D-cell batteries when they start to see this happen within that, that time constraint. Here's what else they know. If, in fact, this leads to the D-cell battery sale, so if these two things happen, they know with 100% certainty that 12 hours later there's going to be a major weather event in the area that is not yet on the weather maps. It is so accurate that the National Weather Service has asked for and been given permission to plug into Walmart's systems to extract data to make their predictions more accurate, not the other way around. The product, in case you're wondering, I assume you want to know, it's strawberry Pop-Tarts. <laughs> so clearly you can see the linear relationship here between, yeah, I mean, Pop-Tarts and, and, and D-cell batteries and weather. I, I, mean, I went to Berkeley, so I can see it. I, I get it. Okay. But you understand, you, this, this is what big data is about. Now, now here's, the, here's the crescendo. Here's the best one of all, okay? Our friends at Target Corporation. Now, this is going to sound like one of those those, you know, two guys walk into a bar jokes, but it's not a joke, okay? So a middle-aged man walked into a Target store in the Midwest. This is a true story. I have, I have all the articles about this stuff if anybody wants them. He walked into a Target store in the Midwest and demanded to see the manager. The manager came out. He said, how can I help you? And the guy looked at him and he said with just loathing in his voice, how dare you? And the guy said, how dare I what? And the man said, how dare you send that to my, to my house? I mean, what's wrong? Why would you send that to my daughter at my house? And the guy said, sir, I don't know you, so I don't know where your house is. And furthermore, if you're talking about like product literature, we don't send anything from the store. It comes from headquarters in, in Michigan or wherever headquarters is. He says, I don't care where it comes from. How dare you send pregnancy-related information to my 16-year-old daughter? What's wrong with you? Well, she was pregnant, and she hadn't told her parents yet, but Walmart knew. I mean, Target knew. And it wasn't because she had bought an early pregnancy test or a book about motherhood or, you know, prenatal vitamins or anything like that. She brought nothing at all. Here's what, here's what uh, big data analytics told the company. For all customers that have the following characteristics, they are between 15 and 17 years old. They have a grade point average between 2.7 and 3.3. They have at least once in the prior month purchased Skittles or have had parents that have purchased Skittles and cotton balls and calcium supplements and this specific brand of unscented hand lotion 100% of the time they're pregnant. I'll pause here for questions. Let me go home, me go home and check my... <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is normally where somebody says, what's the hand lotion? I need, you know. Can parents get notified? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that intriguing? This is science fiction stuff. This is minority report kind of stuff. But it's real. It's real. This is happening today. Now that's kind of creepy and freaky and weird and amazing and not understandable at all. But it's happening all over the place today. And if you think just a little bit beyond these sort of outlandish examples, you start to get a sense of the so <laughs> what here, of how this might in fact change the way we do things. So let, let's, let's just look at some of those things. See, I personally believe that big data is the new crude oil. And I believe that analytics is the new refinery. And in the same way that we get everything from asphalt to high yield alcohol out of a gallon of crude oil, we get a vast array of information products and services out of big data if we know how to refine it properly. And it's the refinement stuff that's going to create the real yield here in terms of insight and human capability and communications and money, big time. You know, 
if your car is idling rough or it's missing or it's doing anything that's not normal, which today increasingly is rare, but if it is, you know you can take it to the garage and they'll take a probe and they'll insert the probe into the exhaust and it'll do a chemical analysis and it'll tell you precisely what's going on, right? I mean, that's just standard. Well, I believe that people create digital exhaust. As you're sitting here, as you're moving around, as you're driving, as you're buying things, when you go to the doctor, as you buy products online and so on, you're creating this exhaust stream of zeros and ones that can be analyzed in the same way to yield insight into you, into populations, into product demands, into all kinds of things. And I'm not going to argue good, bad, right, wrong here. We'll get to that in a minute. But I just want you to understand the nuance that is available from this capability now. It's pretty extraordinary. I mean, the consequences are kind of interesting. We now have the ability in contact centers to not only do what's called screen scraping, which is the instant you call a contact center, they have the ability to download huge amounts of information about you, bless you, some of which is related and some of which is not, to the call itself. And they also now have voice analyzers, spectrum analyzers, built into the system that analyze the stress level in your voice so they can respond to it properly. Okay. I do a lot of work with sales teams and sales organizations to help them understand how to be better at not selling but engaging and, 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 uh, and, and creating a real relationship with a, with a customer. And my business partner and I teach a program where we teach people how to use advanced Google resources. Like most people aren't aware that there is a completely separate network called Google Advanced that gives you completely different results if you search on it than if you search on sort of traditional Google. And one of the things that I demonstrate to them is the ability to identify stuff. Sometimes I'll take a photograph of the class and I'll use this technique in, in Google Advance. So I uploaded this photograph, which is a photograph of some friends of mine. Actually, you know at least one of them. This is, um, this is, this guy's name is Joseph and he owns Chef's Corner in Williston. Okay, and his son, who's in the photograph, used to work here for a while. And I took this photograph. I ran into them in Burlington. They asked me to take their family picture. I did. And just for fun, I uploaded it to, to the Google system. And I said, tell me, tell me what this is. And they said, well, we don't know who everybody is, but the guy in the middle with the blue shirt on is, is Joseph Harrow, and he owns, he owns this business. It had a link to Chef's Corner in it. The woman next to him with blonde hair is his wife. The other people we don't recognize. And by the way, it told me that this was in City Hall Park in Burlington. Wow. Okay? It has the comparative ability to do that, and more often than not, it works. Okay? Now just think about that for a second. So you've got all these pictures in Facebook. And now you have the ability to look at those photographs automatically via systemic means and, and, and kind of analyze them and identify them and get a sense of what people are shooting and where are they and when, when were they there and what else did they post at the time and how are they feeling and boy do I need to market this product to them. <coughs> okay, It's intriguing stuff. So let's just put it all together here as we sort of close in on the end here. I was in an airport recently and heard something and I looked up and it, it, it sounded, it, it sounded kind of like a water buffalo running across the plains and it sort of was. It was an immense human being who didn't need to be running. Clearly late for a flight, and as, he, as this guy went by me, I'm looking for the nearest defibrillator because I know I'm going to need it. This guy, this is not a runner, okay? And I sat there pondering this, and it occurred to me, how hard would it be when you walk into an airport to have your phone register, just like mine did in Tokyo, okay? And to relate that information, now clearly we'd want customers to say, yeah, I'd like, I'd like to be involved in this because it's to my benefit. My flight's late, or I'm late, rather, for my flight. And I'm running down the concourse to get to my gate. How hard would it be for sensors in the ceiling to detect a cell phone moving clearly faster than it should be, scrape the cell phone, get the number, relate it to a customer, look at the list of flights, automate a call to the, to the gate saying, He's two gates away, don't close the door. How hard would that possibly be? It would require zero human intervention to do it. Okay? Here's another one. 
There's a product out there that you can buy called Magic Carpet. It costs $40. It's literally a carpet. It's like a, like a throw rug. And it has built into it all kinds of electronics, all kinds of sensors. And let's say you have a relative, an elderly relative, who doesn't want to go to a care facility or to a retirement home, but they're at that place where it's getting close. This product allows people to stay in their home longer for the following reason. You put it in traffic areas where the person routinely walks, between their bedroom and the bathroom, or between the living room and the kitchen, whatever it may be. And the carpet learns their patterns. And as long as the same patterns get followed day after day, life is good. Nothing happens until the day that they don't. And then a call gets made. Okay? This is a really interesting product and it costs $40. The Proteus Ingestible Event Marker is a little dissolvable capsule with a sensor built into it that you swallow and as it goes through your system it takes enzymatic readings throughout your system and transmits the information to a database that your doctor can now analyze to make sure that pH levels and hormone levels and enzymatic responses and so on are all doing what they're supposed to do and are where they're supposed to be. Okay? Here's an interesting one. This is a company in Mountain View, California called ShotSpotter. ShotSpotter has designed microphones that have the ability to detect the unique sound of a gunshot. And they have deployed these things in major cities all over the United States and Canada. The average response time when a gunshot goes off in a city and somebody reports it, from the time it gets reported until the time police are able to get there traditionally, is about 14 minutes. What ShotSpotter does is when these microphones that are all over the city detect the sound of a gunshot, the information gets transmitted over the internet to ShotSpotter headquarters where multiple microphone inputs identify the actual location and they've reduced the response time to four minutes. Not only that, they're working on a very interesting legal ramification, if you will, that has the following capability. Issue a warrant, they're working on a high-speed warrant to be able to do this, and see if there are any people in the area that have a history of criminal activity involving guns. Oh, there is one? Oh, and they're near where this happened? Okay, turn the microphone on on their phone. Let's just listen. Maybe they'll talk about the crime. Maybe they'll give us insight into where they're going, and so on. Okay? Now, I realize we're bordering on some really interesting constitutional things here. But we're not here to, to, we're not here to debate constitutional law. We're here to talk about capabilities of technology. This one is my favorite. Following the big earthquake and tsunami in Japan, a group of college students in, um, where were they? They weren't in Tokyo, they were in another city, developed an application that they gave away free to everyone in the country. They made it available to everyone, and virtually every cell phone in the country has it, and now it's available. If you go to Japan, they'll actually recommend that you load it up. It costs nothing. And what it does is it ties into the GPS chip and the accelerometer in your phone, and it has the ability to identify the very unique vibrations of the inbound P wave of an earthquake. So you now have, instead of just having sensors wherever the geological survey put them in the country, every single phone in the country is a sensor. It's a seismograph. And all that data is constantly uploaded to a headquarters somewhere that looks at it. And based on what I've read so far, don't quote me on this because I don't know how accurate it is, but the numbers I have seen indicate that they now have the ability to predict an earthquake by about 24 minutes. That's enough time to get away from the coast. And it's free. Okay? So you see, you see kind of what's happening here? I mean, these, these kinds of capabilities are limited only by our imagination in terms of what people are capable of coming up with and you know, identifying a problem and responding with a technology solution. But there's always this part, right? There's always the Dr. Evil part, and that deserves a little bit of talk, okay? Here's what I think is going to happen. 
in the same way that most technologies creep in, are initially rebuffed because of concerns over privacy or confidentiality or whatever, eventually people kind of realize, all right, it's not, it's okay, I'm going to let it in or not. Here's the other thing I think is going to happen. I think we're going to see that many of these technologies will fall under the control of an opt-in only option. Meaning that if I want my information to be tracked, I have to go in and actively say, I want to play. It's the opposite of the do not call list where you have to call them every six months and renew your objection to being called at night. Of course, the do not call list scenario works about as well as thermostats in a hotel room. Okay, They're not really connected to anything. <laughs> Trust me on that. Here's the other thing that's, that I think is a, a big piece of this. Okay, The other thing that I think is a big piece of this is that when you really look at these technologies and you really dig into what they're doing, in many ways they're already being used in ways that we all accept already. So for example, I don't want you tracking me in through a store and making recommendations for products before I leave the store. That's intrusive and horrible and an invasion of privacy. And yet no one complains when Amazon recommends a book to you or a DVD or a new security package for your computer or a new tow ball for your camper. It's the same thing. I believe we're going to see technology creep here and I think that it will naturally and inevitably find its way in even deeper than it already is, but it will be scrutinized and it will be controlled and there will be certain aspects of it that get rejected. And I think that's sort of the natural thing that happens here. So what's coming? Just to wrap this up, well, as I mentioned, the telephone network is going away. Everybody's going to be making calls over IP networks. Mobility is happening. I mean, most of you or many of you have millennial kids. I would love to know how many of them have a phone that has a wire going into a hole in the wall, right? It's just not relevant anymore, right? The website starts to disappear because the phone is the ultimate point of presence device or the ultimate impulse buy device. Everything gets virtualized. IoT ecosystem grows. Generations continue to evolve and change. The millennials are now in their mid-30s. They're middle managers with budgets, which means that they're going to have a lot of influence and a lot of control over how IT budgets get spent because they eat and live and breathe this stuff every single day. Social media becomes increasingly important in many, many, many different venues. And of course, there's no such thing as enough bandwidth. So we're going to continue to see growth there. So with that, I'm going to shut up and happily answer any of your questions. I'm turning to She Who Must Be Obeyed to make sure that I'm good on time and everything else that we yeah. need to do. We have about six minutes. Okay. And also, if anybody's um, not here and has a question for Steve, they could just email morgan at coordinator at commongoodvt.org, and we can get to your question. Absolutely. Any questions? Yes, sir. Curtis, I'm going to bring the mic over. Hi, Curtis from Resource. So it's interesting. You say the website is dead and everything's going mobile, but aren't uh, going on mobile? Aren't they going to our website? Well, or what's the hue? What's the big difference there? Uh, uh, let me give you a real-world example that is that I that I use on a routine basis. So I travel, as many of you know, all the time. I average anywhere from 50 to 70 countries a year in this job, and it's just I live on airplanes. And United, just because they're part of the Star Alliance, is my airline of choice, um, just because I can get where I need to go through them or their partners. Now, United has a website. So let's assume that I'm, that I'm late for a flight. And I'm coming in, and I'm, I'm coming in, and I know I'm, I'm late. I'm probably going to miss it. That means I've got to get off the plane, go find a place to plug in my laptop, hope there's broadband in the airport so I can get to the United website to rebook my flight or do whatever it is I have to do. Okay? Or I can do what I actually do today, which is to download the United app, go in and say, here's how I want to be notified of any changes that occur in my flights, and I want you to automatically find me the next best option, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, it's on my terms. Okay? So as I'm landing, I automatically get a notification from United in email or as a text or as a voicemail, whatever I choose, saying, here's what's going on, here's why it's going on, here's what we've done about it, here's who you call if you have questions. It's automatic. All of the concerns go away. From that one little app on my phone, I can look at my, you know, my miles, my points, all my reservations, I can change things, I can look at a map of the aircraft to see where my seat is. 
it is one of the few things United has done really, really well. Okay, I mean they really have. It's a great application, and other other airlines are doing the same thing. In that sense, because I am mobile, I would much rather have the United app on my phone than go to a website at United. And here's the other important piece of that equation: I am nowhere near being a millennial, but there are a lot of them, and they're all mobile. Which means that anything you can do to use the mobile phone as a way to enhance or modify or influence a lifestyle is going to work in your favor if you're trying to sell something or market something or teach something or send a message, whatever it may be. So anything mobile is going to be a good thing, which means that the mobile app is going to begin to outnumber the number of websites, traditional websites, that people are accessing. Now, can I still go to a website with my phone? Sure, I can assuming it's been properly formatted and the type isn't two points so I can't really read it, you know, it's all that kind of stuff. So that, that I think is the actual answer to the, to the question. It's a, good, it's a good one. You're welcome. Jen? Yes. Hi, thanks. Um, so I'm a small business owner and I work with a lot of small nonprofits and a lot of this big data seems awesome but kind of out of reach in terms of collecting your own data. Mm -hmm. How do you recommend a small organization get access to valuable data for, that works for them? And I'm just going to throw out there, like I know being part of a, another thing, another larger collective, like thinking of like the, um, if you have an app on the, in the app store, mm -hmm. they're going to be making choices to send people to your app if you're the right person. But are there other ways you can do this more personalized? Yeah, so there's, like, there's a couple of questions in there. So let me, let me address them. And if I forget one, just throw something at me. So let's talk about access to the big data capabilities, first of all, okay? Earlier this week, I was with, um, I was with a company in Saskatchewan, Saskatel. They are the phone company in, in Saskatchewan, province of Saskatchewan. And we had this exact conversation, exactly this conversation, not about nonprofits, but about access to this stuff. They said, look, we're a phone, we're the, we are the phone company. We got money. We can do this. But we don't have the ability to build a big data practice. We're not, we're a phone, we don't, we don't do that stuff. What do we do? Short of going out and buying all the capabilities. And I said, the key here is, <laughs> there's an old adage that says the key to success is, is to go find a parade and get in front of it. That's how you become a leader, okay? And the same is true right here, okay? The, the key here is you don't create your own big data engine. You go find a company that's already doing it and you partner with them. And there are lots and lots and lots and lots of companies that are doing that today. You just have to dig for them. And I'm, I'm happy to point you to many of them if you'd like and we can have a separate conversation about that. The point is you don't have to build your own. Now let's talk about data collection. There are lots of ways to collect this kind of data that, uh, that are valuable and they're, they range from the traditional to the ridiculous. So the traditional are things like, for example, um, do I in fact have access to customer telephone, like mobile, mobile information? Do I know when they came in the store? That's very easy to do. Do, they know, do I know when they connected to my Wi-Fi? I'm going to give away free Wi-Fi. When they walk in, they get connected. I now know they're connected. I know they were there. I know how long they were there because I know when they disconnected. Right? What did they buy? How often do they come in? Who are they with? Have they been with that person before? Oh, that's an interesting friendship. Maybe we can influence one person through the other person. You know, it's this kind of non-traditional thinking that generates the issue. Here's the deal. Big, I want to go back to my bright, shiny thing example a moment ago. I hope now you understand that Internet of Things is nice, but that's just a handful of sensors that get glued to the ceiling. Big deal. Unless you've got a way to collect the data they create and then analyze the data, and then here's the really important part. Now that you've got the analysis, what are you going to do with it? Well, that's nice. Put it in the file. Don't even bother to do the implementation, okay? This is the key. You got to have a person that's dedicated to, or an organization dedicated to saying, okay, now that we've got this, what is it telling us? What is it really telling us? How do I use this for the common good? How do I use this to achieve what I'm attempting to achieve? How do I use this to drive my desires forward, okay? There are lots of ways to do that that don't require a huge compute infrastructure. There, you know, now, if you've got somebody that has cloud capabilities, an organization with cloud, this is where you want to be because you can now create, remember I said earlier that this whole big data thing is so new that no one's really doing it big scale commercially? Not only that, 
the entire software suite that makes it work is open source. It's not even commercial software, it's free. It's part, it's, it's an application, if you, those of you collecting weird names, it's called Hadoop, H-A-D-O-O-P. Hadoop is named after the toy blue elephant that was owned by the four-year-old son of the developer of Hadoop, so he named it, don't ask. Anyway, it's part of the Apache suite, okay? It's, 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 it's part of this open source suite, which means it's free, and anyone can download it, and anyone can create an application from it. And I'm happy to point you at people that can help you do that locally. I mean, that's, that's a piece of cake. And then if you know somebody that's got cloud, that's where the data goes. You point your Hadoop engine at it, and blam, the information falls out the bottom. And it's almost that simple. It's not difficult to do. Be glad to help you with that. Thank you so much. You're welcome so much. And uh, thanks for the folks that are, thank you very much. Always. That was great. We appreciate it. Of course. Um, thank you very much to Steve Shepard, and thank you very much for being here. Steve. Thanks, Lauren Glenn. Appreciate it.